some flashy thingies. Yay. Oh, yes, we have sound. Awesome. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, the chat says they can hear you. Yay. Oh, my gosh. Thank you guys for being patient. Yes. <laughs> what a, you know what? This what is pain so that was. totally um, normal. This all is right. so I don't even know what I just did, normal. but I will sort it out later. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, don't right worry about now, it. We're going to uh, um, keep this. Okay. Yes. Um, and so I've had to disable that so I could run it through here. So do you want me to run down my, my list of stuff I've done while you're working on things? Yeah, let's do that. Like, okay. Like, take okay, take a moment to brag. Give, give us the, okay. give us the good news. Here. This is not bragging. This is just a history lesson. No, it me. should, it can be bragging. Um, That's fine. <laughs> okay. About, uh, you know what? It's weird. I'm not really sure how many years ago. I think it was about nine years ago. I took a hat keto based self-defense class because I was writing a fight scene and didn't know the first thing about fighting. And I thought, well, I'll go to one or two self-defense classes. How hard can it be? Obviously. I kept doing it and it was a lot of college students and they went all back to college and I showed up and it was just me. And the instructor, who was uh, a terrifying looking man, like Mr. Clean, like Mr. Clean, and his, his partner was even bigger than he is. And he's like, you know what? You're not bad at this. And I'm like, well, I'm not good at it. And um, I cried a lot, not joking, because it really scared me having somebody come at me like that. And he came at me. And, um, but I kept going and he said, why don't you try the MMA training class? And I said, uh, I can't do that. And he goes, sure you can. And I'm like, no, I can't. So I went ahead and did it. And I did the MMA training class for about three years, and I did not get in the cage and fight. I didn't start martial arts till I was in my late 30s. Um, so I stayed with that, and from there I did Taekwondo, and I was introduced from MMA. You know, MMA and mixed martial arts is just a wide swath of all the different martial arts together. Um, but specifically, um, I also did uh, Taekwondo, some Muay Thai, um, judo, Aikido, Iaido, um, I know I'm forgetting some, Filipino martial arts. I have experience in street defense, which is self-defense with guns and knives. Um, I had a, a professor who was kind enough to teach me a tiny bit of Kung Fu. I call it kind of Fu. And um, I still do and compete in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, so that's my, that's my fight background. And, and you're I'm working up to a, a competition coming coming up, right? Aren't you? I do. I have yeah. a competition next month, November 21st, two days before my 48th birthday. So awesome. Awesome. Crazy. Which, where I was going with that initially is this is why Carla is qualified to speak about hitting people in creative and effective ways. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, her website. Yeah. And fight... I've also taught self-defense and all that good stuff. Yeah. And her website, fightright.net, which you can see on the screen here, um, has been a Writer's Digest best site for writers um, in 2019 and 2020. She has a podcast, which you should probably check out. And she has a book called Fight Right. Yes. Uh, easy to put together. So, uh, oh, yes, it is displayed behind, it's right? Oh, lovely framing. Beautiful. Right. Beautiful. Yes. All right. Um, so, all kinds of um, good stuff. So, um, also, Carla's just kind of awesome. Like, we met at a conference oh, I, five years ago, I think. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. And um, just, I, I, I think Carla's a great person. Like, we had a costumed event, and she came just, like, covered in an apron, covered with blood and red hands yeah. and all sorts of things and, you know, knives yeah. and whatever. And she had come costumed as an editor killing our writers yes. darlings and um, <laughs> because that's this. really what I started I started as a fight scene editor that yeah. was my first I mean I'd, I'd had a lot of writing experience I used to write for a magazine and all that and I had done some editing and, and that was kind of my first thing was I signed with quill pen editorial as their fight scene editor so that was my first job perfect and in the um, right and yeah are you still taking individual consults for fight scenes too um, I yeah, know. I do sometimes. Okay. Um, Enclave Publishing, my um, my agent is Steve Lobby, and he owns Enclave Publishing. And whenever he has a fight scene come across his editor's desk that he's like, mm, he passes it along to me. Yeah. And so, yeah, sometimes I do one-on-one -on -one consulting. It just kind of depends on my schedule. But I may start doing that a little bit more. And I also teach for Writer's Digest University now. 
and I contribute to their blog. I think I have a regular shtick with them now, once a month. So all of that, the, the hub from which you can all find all that. things Carla is firewright.net and, right. um, and track that down. So, but I wanted yes. to just take tonight, you know, the learn with me is always like, let's just go have fun. Let's explore something yeah. that writers frequently struggle with. Um, yeah. And I mean, I love writing action scenes. Like You are so like good at it too. That, you know what, for those of you who don't know, Laura and I hit it off like that. It's like, we didn't even speak. We're just like, we get along. All right. So I, I have to you. tell you we get along. possibly one of my favorite ever Carla stories. And it's a little oh, no. hard to pick one, but there's, there's one that's particularly epic in my mind. We were at a conference and Carla Ooh. was taking appointments with writers to shop uh, yeah. f- action scenes. Mm-hmm. And and you needed uh, an extra body to do some demonstration with. <laughs> you remember this? And yeah, I so, think I do. Keep going. Yeah. So Carla's was like, hey, Laura, can I borrow you? And we need to, you know, work out this scene. With this, <gasps> I with this do other. remember yes. this. Okay. Keep telling. <laughs> so um, there was a writer and I, 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 I think the scene, like I, I wasn't involved in the, in the, in the consults at all, but I think the scene was like a, like a sexual assault scene. And so An she's intimate like, intimate oh. assault it was. Yeah. So you're like, yeah. you know, attack me, get me on the floor. You're going to be choking me out while, you know, putting me in this position and, you know, so yeah. we're down and we, obviously this is not the kind of thing you just do in the middle of the cafeteria. Right. So we had <laughs> nicked around the corner, um, just yeah. me and the, and the writer, um, uh-huh. and ducked into this dark room that wasn't being used <laughs> and so she's off to the side you and i are, are down working out our position i've got my hands right. around your throat and a hotel employee walks in and turns on the lights <laughs> it's just you and me on the floor me choking you out in this incredibly compromising position and somebody standing there taking notes and um, yeah it was yeah yeah so that's it we, we're done with the episode that that's enough yeah. um, right everybody's yeah. to go check out but, okay. um, it was so helpful i really need it and i knew I know. See, here's the thing. Whenever you do things like that, people think you can just grab anybody. You've got to grab someone who has some fighting knowledge. Otherwise, they won't respond in the way they should respond. So I really, you are very helpful on that. I appreciate (laughs) it. And I think what I actually said was, I think I need you to rape me. Can we just walk? And you're like, I'm like, you know, they need it for their work. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go do that. Yeah. So, um, so all that said is like, Hey guys, it's open question night. Um, and yes. <laughs> yeah, what we, where are we going to go? As you can see, there's no standards. Right. Just ask whatever <laughs> you want to ask. The bar, the bar has been set. <laughs> there we yes. Go. Um, yes. But let's, um, let's do, let's talk about, because fight scene, I mean, we've all read the fight scenes that, you know, there's, there's two kinds of horrible fight scenes. There's the, this, this has no purpose in the story. We just stuck it in here to have an action scene. And there's right. the, um, oh my gosh, this is supposed to be dramatic and I'm laughing too hard to be able to read. You know, and, and we want to stick You know what? And there. there's one more. There's one more that it's the writer saying, let me show you how much I know about fighting. Oh, fights. yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the hard tech version of a fight scene, you know, and yes. like, I'm going to read yes. you all the specifications of the Orion yes. Drive only with yes. this. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, um, so <laughs> that. If we want to avoid those, um, we right. start with just what are kind of some rules of thumb to, okay. um, to you know, my, my checklist for not being bad. We're not yet yeah. to being good. I just want to avoid right. being bad. You know, wh- right. where do we start? Well, you know what? I'm actually in the, I've just started a series um, on fightright.net on things to remember when you're actually writing the fight scene. And this week, uh, the subject is how much. How much of the action do you write? And I give two examples. And the first example I have is um, a recap by a sports journalist of the Thrilla in Manila, the fight that was in 73, I think, between uh, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. And it is considered one of the greatest boxing matches of all time. And then I tell you the stats. I think there was about 500 punches thrown. It was a ridiculous amount of punches. And I tell you how much action took place. And then we read what the journalist wrote. And the journalist did not write, he did this, and then he did this, and then he did, you don't do that. And even when you have people who know about fighting, and I am in circles of people who we watch fighting pretty regularly and we talk to each other about the fights. When we talk to each other and we recap a fight, we don't go through every single move. Even though we're all familiar with the moves, we don't. We just highlight the big points. After the um, 
the recap from the journalist, I have, and I hate that I don't have my iPad with me. I have um, a fight scene. People generally ask me, oh, tell me what are some of your favorite fight scenes? And go figure, some of my favorite fight scenes are from Fight Club. Um, I love Chuck Palahniuk. If you've not read his work, he's raw, so you have been warmed. But those fight scenes are brilliant because they are very... Um, like one or two sentences. People tend to be surprised when they find out the book Fight Club isn't about fighting, really. Yeah, there's a club and people get together and they have a slugfest, but that's not really what the book's about. And his fight scenes, oh, I wish I had it, are just completely brilliant because it's just like he says, there's a sleeper hold where you somebody puts your head underneath their arm and then they just pound your face. And you you imagine all of this going on, but he doesn't go action by action by action. He highlights the bigger points. Um, and this really not highlighting the bigger points. I really think readers more than wanting to know what happens in the fight scene, technically, they want to know the impact it has. And I, I tell that, I tell writers um, in my um, class for Writer's Digest, one of the things that I really stress is get your reader off the couch and get them into the arena. And here's what I mean by that. Um, when you watch any type of sporting event on TV, you have a better vantage of what's going on than the, than the players do. If you're watching a fight, let's say that, you know, we're watching a boxing uh, match, we have a better view than the boxers. We have a better view than the coaches. We have a better view than the cameramen because the cameramen are only seeing one view at a time. We get to switch around to all the different cameramen and see what's going on. So when you have that great of a perspective on a fight, why would you ever go see a fight in person? Why is it we watch football games and not with COVID, but previously there would be hundreds of thousands of people in the stand. If you have a better view of the game at home, why would you ever go to the arena? And that's because what you see at home and what you can't see in the arena, you feel. Mm -hmm. There's just a and you feeling. And you 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 do. There's an electricity in the air. And I just got, I just got chills thinking about it. And that's what you want for your reader. You want to get them off the couch where it's just, you know, a 2D kind of passive thing. You really want to get the sensory thing in there. Cause you know, when, when you go see fights, you, you really don't, you have a very not great perspective of what's going on, but you see the faces and you hear the crowd. Even if you don't see the faces, you feel the crowd around you. And I think you really need to make it a sensory experience for your reader. And remember, if it is first person, if your fight is first person, that sensory experience is going to be much different than, obviously, third person. I have, You know, I was thinking, I was like, okay, second person. I don't know if I've ever read a book that's second person, but it's going to be very different because when you are the, on the inside of the fight, there's not a lot of emotion, if any. Um, it's, it's just very simple, straight, straightforward survival kind of thoughts. You may feel some pain. And I have a video on YouTube about this on 10 lies, uh, writers need to know about before they write their fight scene. And one of them is people say, oh, you don't feel anything when you're fighting. That's not true. You do feel some, it's to a lesser extent than when the adrenaline ebbs, but, um, you really need to get the sense of your experience and imagine, okay, what perspective is this being told from? If it's from the person inside the fight, you need to understand that's a whole different game than from the person on the outside looking in. The person outside looking in is going to see things, hear things, smell things that the people on the inside of the fight won't so much. Um, since you're watching this, you'll get a sneak. I'll go ahead and tell you what I'm going to blog about next. And that's what actions do you need to highlight while you're writing your fight scene? And if any point I need to stop talking because no. I'm going off subject. No, Please we, tell me. We, we got, okay. um, I'm here till like what, 8 a.m. So we're good. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> okay. Um, when you are trying to decide, and I point, I think I pointed this out a little bit in the blog post this week, but it'll, I'll go more into it next week. When you're trying to figure out, okay, what actions should I highlight and what actions should I just let slip by? You know, we don't tell everything in our books. I don't know the last time I read a book that included the character saying, hold on, I need to go to the bathroom. But it's understood characters are real. They eat, they sleep, they go to the bathroom. That's how, that's how life works. And, and it's the same thing with fight scenes. You don't have to include everything. Some things, some things are understood.
But to really figure out what moves you need to highlight, imagine that the fight scene was in a comic book or a graphic novel. Imagine what, what actions would be highlighted in those panels. Comic books and graphic novels are fantastic resources for people writing fight scenes because um, comic book, if, if you don't know, um, if you're not familiar with comic book writing, it, it's very difficult because you have to tell an entire story in a panel in one little frame. And so you only have a certain amount of room that you can um, put words and it's, it's amazing. Sometimes they have to go back and redraw it because they realize they haven't left enough room, but you have a limited amount of space for words. And so you really have to show. And so you, that's why you see the look on their faces. You see the sweat fly off. You see the call out balloons, you know, boom, crack, pow. They are only illustrating the moves that make the difference in the fight. Now, they will highlight the small moves if it changes the fight. If one of the characters reaches behind their back slowly and pulls out a knife, they're going to show that right. because it's going to change the course of the fight. So just, just read through it and, you know, jot down a little piece of paper and say, okay, in what, what would show up in a comic book panel? So no, I think I answered the question. And um, we got some comments in the chat um, when you were talking oh, about good. the impact of, you know, being present versus being yes. on TV. And Natalie's talking about that makes sense that, you know, you're going to get that different vibe there. You and, such a um, different vibe, right? Oh, yeah. It's just um, so uh, you, you, you dropped some hints from my, from, we're going to segue into my next question there because you didn't know you were setting me up for that. So thank oh, you. Oh, good. Um, but, you know, we're, I was, uh, we have fights that can just be action scenes or we can have fights that can be part of the plot. Um, and right. so you're actually advancing characterization and right. plot in there. Um, so how much self-awareness is there in a fight and how much of that changes with the type of fight that it is? That's a really good question. Um, so what we're talking about is if you are the person fighting and if it's being told from your point of view, um, First of all, you've got to take into account adrenaline. Fighting is science. A lot of times people say, well, how do you know this? How do you know this? I don't know this. I know science. Okay. Now this, I do happen to know firsthand. Adrenaline has um, some objectives. And one of the objectives is of adrenaline is to dull your emotions. You don't want to be as emotional as you are in everyday life if you're in a life or death situation because you don't need to think about the ramifications of what's happening to you. Um, so your emotions are a little bit dulled. Your pain response is a little bit dulled. Um, you don't feel fear. It's not fear. It's something very different. And I actually, um, I'm in several uh, women's jujitsu groups on social media, and I asked one of them, well, somebody was saying they had a really hard time with anxiety before they competed, and, and what do you do about that? And I said, well, here's the thing. You're only going to be afraid until the, the ref says go. And she was like, I don't know. I think I'm afraid the whole time. I don't, it, it's not fear so much as there is a, um, hmm, it, it's, uh, there's a drive to survive. There is a drive to win, but once you're in that moment and the fight starts, nothing else exists. There is nothing else. You can, I have competed in a room where there were hundreds of people. And, um, from the time that, you know, the ref says go, there's nothing. Sometimes you can't even hear things. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, Dif uh, you know, that's just a known th factor of, you know, what adrenaline yes. does to you is you just get that tunnel vision, it has a purpose. you get auditory exclusion, like all of right. that is very well Absolutely. documented. Yes. And, and all of that has a purpose for your survival. I can only hear my coach. It is the weirdest thing. Every now and then I'll hear somebody else, but I hear my coach. He has, he's a very loud voice and it's also a very heavy Brazilian accent. So that kind of helps. But one time I couldn't hear him. One time I couldn't hear him. I got my butt kicked hard, but on the inside of the fight, it's just not that big of a sensory experience. On my blog, I also have, if you'll go to the index, I think it's called Being Attacked. And I interviewed a woman who was attacked by half a dozen people. And um, one of the things, too, people think is people kind of hit you one at a time. That's what you see in the movies. That, that doesn't work that way. If a group of people descends upon you, guess what? They're going to all find a place to beat you up. 
and they were all beating her up. And I asked her uh, in that moment, did you feel fear? She said, no. She said when she realized what was happening and they were coming at her, absolutely. It was like an explosion of terror. But once they descended upon her, she said, there's just a drive to survive. So you do not have um, thoughts like um, ramifications of, oh, my leg is broken. And I was in a serious car accident in, in a uh, high school and, you know, soaked in adrenaline. And I do remember looking down at my legs and very matter of factly saying, my legs are broken. And somebody reached, wanted to reach in the side of the car and pull me out. And they said, you know, step on the steering wheel. Cause we we're on our side. And I said, my legs are broken. It was just a very matter of fact thing. And I knew I couldn't feel it. And I figured once they put me on my feet to walk, then I would feel it. Um, so you do have to dull it down a lot. It's going to be much greater sensory experience for the onlookers because they're going to hear it. You're going to hear the smacks. There sometimes is a smell. If there's enough blood, there's a smell. If it's a room where a fight is taking place, like in an arena, there's a hormone, testosterone, sweat kind of smell to it. Um, I think women have a different, uh, sweat smell than men do when they fight, um, so on the outside looking in, there's going to be greater sensory experience than if you are the one actually fighting. Did yeah. I answer the question? No, that's, that's great. And, okay, good. And I think, um, so part, this is one of those things where writing realistically is so different from writing to expectations that it's right. sometimes really hard as a writer to make those choices. Um, you right. Know, and, um, so I had a, um, experience where, um, uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in how we got here, but the very short version is I had a dog trying to eat my face. Um, for those of you who mm. don't know, like in my day job, I work in animal behavior and mm -hmm. um, this is not how it's supposed to go. Okay. This was a culmination <laughs> of um, the very short version is I was not given correct information before I got into this situation. And then uh. I was like, oh, I have found the actual problem and it is eating me. Okay. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I, so the dog comes up and, um, his, his jaw actually latches. I mean, that's what this is here. <laughs> so that's all that oh my gosh. Uh, here. And then the, his lower, his lower jaw was in my throat. And, um, Ooh. so as he's in the act of biting, and then I just went into this absolute time dilation where I had all the time in the world to yep. think about how I was going to not pull back because that would cause right. more tearing. And I, you know, I had all right. this you know time to think about it, but in a book, if I wrote, and I sat down and I had this paragraph of thinking about the situation, you know, it's going to feel so unrealistic to the reader yeah. because, and, you know, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's just that adrenaline will give you that time dilation effect, but right. it's going to slow down the it experience is strange. for the reader. Yeah, it does. And, and it's weird because you will look back and you'll have several different memories. You'll think, okay, this is what happened. And then you'll have another memory. You're like, okay, which one happened? And I actually, I think I've written on this time really does slow down magically. And it's because our brain is trying to lay down memories for us. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's slow. Time is not actually slowing down, but your brain is hyper-focusing to try to lay down certain memories because again, adrenaline wipes out the, everything except what is most imperative in that moment. I had a fighter describe it one way, and I think this is the most beautiful way to say it, that uh, when you get hit in the face, or if you, when you get in a terrifying situation like that, it's just an invitation to complete awareness. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's perfect because you are 100% in that moment. Nothing else in the world exists. You know, when that dog was on you, you are not thinking about dishes you need to do. You are not thinking about anything that's happening at home. You are 100% in that moment. So that is something that you can add to your fight scene. And you know, the thing is, it's different for everybody. And I've talked about this as far as pain. How much pain do you feel during the course of a fight? It's different for everybody. And so I think whatever level of pain or whatever level of awareness you give your character isn't going to be far off. You just need to know the basics of adrenaline that the thought process is going to be very um, simplistic. And it was like you were saying, do not pull away, do this, do that. It wasn't, oh my gosh, this is going to scar me. So I need to do, no, it's 
this is what needs to happen right now in this moment. And that's, that is one of the beautiful things about being in a horrible situation is you do understand the importance of being completely in the moment. I have told people when uh, people get injured in class and stuff, and they're like, oh, it's no big deal. And I'm like, hey, pain is the body's way of saying, be here right now. Be here now in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think in, in a fight too, when you're in that fighting for your life situation, it, it is an invitation to complete awareness, to be completely in that moment. Nothing else in the world exists. And which is why, which is why um, I see, I've had people in fight scenes um, where they have two people fighting and there are um, different techniques that are two person fighting techniques. However, if you are just in a fight on the street or if you're in like a bar room brawl, so if a fight just kind of breaks out in, in your work, I'm not talking about two people with swords. And it's generally swords that I've seen. There's a lot of two fighting styles where they have learned to fight back to back and rotate a certain way. Other than that, um, a coach that I used to work with, um, he said, look, if, if you and I are out and it all hits the fan, get away from me. Because if we bump into each other, we're going to turn around and start pounding each other because you get fight blind. You don't understand, oh, this is my person next to me. Oh, yeah. So that is how blind you are in that moment. Yeah. And, you know, you get this adrenaline, again, just the things we know about adrenaline. Um, oh, you know, my gosh. You can, you can be absolutely tunnel visioned and to auditory absolutely. exclusion to the point that people do not hear gunshots, which are no. kind of loud, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but you might notice the blue paper clip sitting on the desk because you're yes. working such weird, you know, little minutia because you're, you know, just yeah. that hyper focus. Um, yeah. and then, you know, you were talking about, um, recalling things and, um, again, something that I've, you know, we, it's just a weird feature, but you know, like if there's, um, I remember a few years ago, there was a big train wreck and they said they were going to interview, um, the, uh, the engineer, um, in, in three days time or something. And there was, I, mm -hmm. there was a outcry, like, why are you waiting to you know, ask him now? And I'm like, no, no, no. If he had no. that kind of experience, literally his brain won't recall things for no, a few days until won't. you dump all those chemicals that are in there. Right. Because and that's something you don't write. Keep going, keep going. Oh, I was just saying, like that's just again, it's a thing that we know when we understand. It sounds weird. It's against right. expectations, but in that moment, your brain was not concerned with the most organized filing system available. Okay, Absolutely your brain not. was concerned Absolutely with not. let's keep breathing. We'll figure out what happened later, and and right. so that's where you get you know some. It's not that the it's not that the police witness changed their story, um, you know, no. from day day you one to day You got to get that three. adrenaline dump, and that's something yeah. you don't see very often in writing is the adrenaline dump, and it is yeah. miserable. Yeah, it is painful, especially if you're in a fight situation. Let's say that um, a trained fighter goes in, and within the first thirty seconds, they you know, like in jujitsu, if I get the choke in the first thirty seconds or the knockout. And you don't have a place to really push that adrenaline. It's painful. You are in physical pain from there just being so much adrenaline inside you and you haven't had a chance to spend any of it. Um, I also shake um, after, after when I've had a big adrenaline rush, like sometimes after a fight, I get real shaky. Um, I, I have, I cry sometimes and, and some people, not me, but you will see this is generally in life or death situations, but you'll see people in the movies, you know, the stereotypical person that wets their pants. That's not because they're a coward. It's because their body is focusing on things that are more important. So, but once that adrenaline starts dumping, it is just the most miserable, miserable feeling. And that is something, that is something I would like to see. Um, you are also shockingly sore, even in places that were not utilized you know, during the fight, let's say that, you know, it was a sword fight and it was over, you know, fairly quickly. And the next day, for some reason, your legs hurt and your back hurts. And you're like, I hardly fought. Well, that's because you were tense and you're more, you're holding your body more tense than you realize. So yeah, once, not only is adrenaline, dr adrenaline does not make you a superhero. It only accentuates what you have. Now you do have cases where you have and, and there's a technical scientific word for it. You may know it. Well, people have superhuman strength and they pick up cars and things like that. Um, 
but for the most part, it just accentuates what you already are. So yeah. is your character going to be able to pick up something that's incredibly heavy? Yeah, they may be able to pick up something that's incredibly heavy. A bus? Mm, maybe not if they're a human. And then after the fact, they're going to be sore. I, I have some um, blog posts on adrenaline, too, that is just, it's an amazingly beautiful Adrenaline is really a gift. It really is. It, and if you have a fight scene in your work, you need you need to know about adrenaline. And Natalie's mentioning in the chat, you redirected aggression. So that's it'd be something as simple as, you know, that blind fighting that you're talking about. You bump yes. into me and I turn and hit you. But also Absolutely. redirected aggression can happen when I've got so much of that loaded adrenaline ready to go. I don't have a place to put it. You say something you think is funny. And um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, you're that. not thinking clearly. Mm -mm. You're literally not thinking clearly. When I, um, when I teach self-defense, um, people think that sometimes, okay, different cultures do have different personal distances. And in the United States, whether people believe it or not, if you are a European American, look like Laura and I do, you tend to have a pretty large personal distance. And other cultures, their personal distances are much smaller, but it's not the culture that decides what your personal bubble is. It's actually, I believe your hippocampus, it's actually your brain that decides what is an appropriate distance from you. <clears throat> and when that is because, and you know, if you've, I, I've said that, you know, when a really nice looking person stands next to you and you get butterflies and you can't think, you're literally in fight or flight. Now, you're not having to fight or flight in that moment. But when someone enters your bubble that closely and you have that kind of interaction with them, your body knows technically they can hurt you way more than if they're over there. So even just having a person really close to you, when you can't think, when you are in adrenaline, you just don't think clearly. Another thing that you see in movies, a, a trope that is 100% real is they have a hard time loading the gun with little bullets. You don't have fine motor skills. Mm -hmm. This is why it is important. This is why fighters spar. You do not spar to learn. You spar in order to teach your muscles to do the things you already know how to do under the effects of adrenaline. You teach it muscle memory. I know that if um, I'm in a certain position in jiu-jitsu, I'm immediately going to put my hand here. And I don't even think about doing it. There's a saying in jiu-jitsu is if you think you're late. And that's true. And so um, if you have a fighter in your work, uh, you know, if they do swords, if they do fist fighting, whatever they do, they are going to spar. And that's because they have to teach themselves how to work with adrenaline. I have a friend who's also a jiu-jitsu fighter. There's a firefighter. And I said something to him. I said, you know, you actually have a little bit of an advantage competing because you're a firefighter. And he's like, no, I don't. And I'm like, you're used to adrenaline. Mm -hmm. You know what adrenaline does to you and you know how to work through that fog and it truly is a fog. Oh yeah. 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 And Natalie's pointing out in the chat, you know, man, so much of this overlaps perfectly with panic attacks. Absolutely the same thing. You're oh gonna, my god. You're gonna lose because functionally that is what a panic attack is, right? It's it just is. misapplied. You know, your body goes Absolutely. into that mode when you're not in survival mode. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And your so, body thinks it's being attacked. And that's one thing that again, I think um, if you have a, a character, sorry, I'm going to jump in here, but if you've got a character oh, who is do, used to, do. you know, being in this kind of situation, they are going to train for that kind of situation. So, um, Absolutely. like I, I've talked before about, um, competing and shooting. And if you're right. either under pressure in pressure and competition, or if you're in a, you know, self-defense situation or something, um, you're not going to have fine motor skills. Okay. So I have no. I don't ever practice with the magazine release on, on my pistol that I would never touch that. No, you grab that slide because one of these is a tiny little finger boot fingertip movement. And one of these is a, right. you know, just flapper fingers. Go. Right. And right. so you go with the thing that you're going to be able to do under stress. And, right. um, so yeah, it's just, that's, that's how, you know, that person should be training, um, is right. for, I, because when you're, uh, and again, let's go back to the science of it. Um, I'm under, I'm under adrenaline. My body's like, Oh, we got to keep breathing here. Can I tell you what, let's pull blood away from all the extremities so that if something right. gets cut off, we don't lose everything that's important inside. Absolutely. And so you start losing feeling in your fingers and you know, you, your, your limbs will get tingly and numb and mm -hmm. all of this stuff. And so I just, um, right. I'm going to detour. I, t I uh, 
I did um, a rappelling trip into a cave in New Zealand, which was oh, completely amazing. You do the coolest stuff. <laughs> I used to. Yeah, back when we you traveled. Do. Um, <laughs> and, but it started with a 150 foot rappel straight down into this cave shaft. And I'm not a big fan of heights. And this was Oof. my first ever rappelling experience. Ooh. So great combo. Um, and so I'm up there and I've practiced and practiced and practiced. You know, I got to, I got to go down the side of a hill and practice. So that was good. And, um, I get up to the front and the, our guide's there and he's like, okay, you know, um, you know, get up to the hole or whatever. And I, the guide's like, okay, are you ready to go? And I'm like, I can't feel my arms and legs, but I'm telling myself yeah. I'm just cold, you know, <laughs> like, right. it's like, and I had told them, I said, look, this is going to be really scary. I can manage it. Like behavior is what I do for a living. Just let me, mm -hmm. let me manage it in my way. And I was fine. Right. And I got to the bottom and then I got the adrenaline dump and I'm like, I need to just take a minute to right. get my legs back before I start walking. Right. <laughs> so. Not vomit. Vomit's another thing. You will vomit sometimes if you have that much adrenaline going because the body's like, we don't, we don't need the stomach. We don't need what all's in here. Just get rid of it. Well, and the vomiting and the urinating and the defecating and all that, like if you yes. have to run, lose weight, right? Like those are natural yes. responses to yes. get yes. out. And also if something's trying to eat you, it can make you slightly less attractive. Right. But on, yes. honestly, those are, those are lose weight, get agile um, things. Yeah, they so, are. Hey, I think we, yeah, I think we may have a Scott in the chat. Is that a Scott who just joined us? He says, hello, Laura and Carla. This is the first Twitch I've watched. So yay. yay. Thank you. Awesome. So, um, okay. That's a role maker, Scott. I'm assuming it, it might <gasps> be role makers, but I don't know. It's a role maker Yay. somebody. Okay. <laughs> so thanks for stopping by. Um, hey guys, I, again, in the chat, feel free to throw in questions. I mean, otherwise Carla Please and do. I will go until the room runs out of oxygen. But since we have two rooms, we will go twice as long. So That's right. uh, just jump in if you have a question. Okay. I have a question um, for you, Carla, because this is mm -hmm. something that, um, hey, this, this, I, I, I will, I will need this. <laughs> this is personal. This is totally selfish. Uh -huh. I have an awesome uh, protagonist you know, uh -huh. skilled, my, my readers like this person because this person is skilled and tra trains hard, but uh -huh. it's not yet the end of the book. And I need my protagonist to lose this fight. <laughs> what are okay. things that can go wrong so that we lose without making our protagonist look lame? Because as Americans, we like people who don't lose. <laughs> so I know it's the craziest thing. That's not how life works. Um, well, it depends on what kind of do you want me to just do in, in general or do you want me to do specific to what her fight is? Oh, oh I'm just thinking in general. Like these are, okay. um, yeah, just have a good time. If Here's not, something people don't think about. Blood in the eyes um, or when you get uh, your nose broken um, in a fight and, you know, you, you see somebody get their nose broken and then they have blood coming out right here. What you don't see is all that blood going down their throat. And so that makes it harder to breathe. That's why it's a problem when fighters get their nose broken in fights. It's because it's harder to breathe and you get out of breath and sometimes you get choked and you cough. So you can get a uh, choke on uh, your blood. You can get blood in your eyes, which hampers your vision. Um, crazy enough, man, if you twist your ankle hard enough, and I know that sounds so goofy, but if you twist your ankle hard enough, it doesn't support your body. Even if you don't feel it that well, it just doesn't support your body. As far as working with swords, break that wrist. That's Aikido. That's the whole basis of Aikido. Um, well, not the whole basis, but it is to take a sword from your opponent and you break their wrist so that they can't pick that sword back up. So think, okay, what is most important for my character in this fight? If they are punching, guess what? They need their hand. And if they don't have on a glove and they punch somebody, it is it is completely feasible that they will break their hand. To me, it's more feasible that they end up breaking their hand than if they don't. That if they just pound on somebody's face without a glove on and their hands are totally fine, that's not how science works. Unless they're a big person and they have, you know, calcified calcifications on their bones or something. Um, but breaking bones in the hand, ooh, a broken rib. Um, I have, I've seen fighters break ribs in like the first few minutes of a fight and still finish like a five minute round. Oh, that's impressive. But it is impressive. Um, and it's stupid, but it was impressive. <laughs> the thing with the broken rib is you just can't move your body as well because you know, 
you do feel the pain. Obviously, you're going to feel it exponentially more once that adrenaline goes away. But he said he heard it pop and he could and he put his hand down and he could feel that it was kind of poking. Ooh. And you just can't you can't move in certain directions. You t- can't take a, a deep breath. Um, so any type of break can take you out of it. A hit to the head, hit to the head will take you out of it. Blood in the eyes, blood down the throat. Um, anything like that. It's absolutely 100% feasible. Those are, those are great suggestions. Awesome. I'm going to replay absolutely this to feasible. take notes and do terrible things to my characters. So. <laughs> Especially if they have a weapon, breaking those wrists is a big deal. Mm-hmm. It's a very big deal. And that's, going to take a while to recover from like you don't just get over it that does movie. yeah because those bones are so little and mm-hmm. it makes sense that that's why they end up having to get pins when you have little bones that are broken they end up having to be pinned because it's so hard to keep them in place so if you have a work that's a historical work you know if it's a, a fantasy um which tends to take place you know kind of in the medieval time period as a backdrop it makes complete sense that your character um, is a right-handed character and they break their wrist and they can't fight with that hand ever again. And then they have to be a left-handed swordsman, which is a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. It's a whole different, whole different shtick. Um, so not healing properly and being damaged for life. And another good thing about things like broken ankles, broken wrists and all that, it, it allows the character to keep talking. So they're not completely, they're not taken out of the dialogue, but they are taken out of the action. Whereas if you get them knocked unconscious or even a good concussion, they just, they can't talk as well. Yeah. Same thing with the broken rib. You just don't, you can't talk quite as much with a broken rib because you may not be able to take that full breath right. or it's going to be strained talking. Yeah. Yeah. And you have an excellent point about, you know, the state of medicine being such an influencer. I mean, oh, we, huge. we are so spoiled today. We do not realize so how um, spoiled. I was, you know, just reading about World War One and injuries and uh, this uh, captain who was shot in the arm in World War One and 18 months later was still, um, you know, not fully functional at, you know, like, I mean, partially bedridden from an arm shot, right. which today's audiences would be like, what kind of ridiculous thing? Well, no, because you don't have penicillin and you don't right. have, you know, everything right. going on. It's like, these are, right. um, these were major life affecting you right. know, things. So we during have that a question. time, if the, if the wound didn't kill you, the hospital would. Yeah. <laughs> so if it wasn't the wound, it was going to be the subsequent infection after <laughs> Henry the eighth. Wasn't he one, he had a wound on his leg that just didn't heal? Henry VIII, we all had this image of his being this great, you know, fat man. I don't think he always was. I think he Mm -hmm. at one time in his life was quite athletic and fit. Yeah. And then he ended up being wounded. I think it was the leg and it would not heal and it Mm -hmm. smelled and it was terrible. And that time they didn't have antibiotics. Right. People don't realize the importance of mold. Right. (laughs) Mold is important. (laughs) Yes. All right. We have a question in the chat from Natalie. He's talking about feeling pain through adrenaline. Do you notice a difference between sharp cutting pains and dull bruising pains? Yes, I do. Um, Hmm. Let me, let me uh, take a, an extreme example in my book. I uh, interviewed several people and I actually have a friend who was uh, shot in the leg, which I, strangely enough, that's where most people are shot. The majority of accidental and purposeful shots hit the legs not the trunk of the body. Anyway, um, I've read different, him, he personally, it did not register to him that he had been shot. He felt like somebody had taken his legs out from underneath him with a bat, you know, and then once he hit the ground and he realized what was happening around, he was like, oh, I've been shot. So with him, it didn't register. Other people, it absolutely does. Um, one man that I interviewed that was uh, stabbed, he said that the, the person attacking him, he thought he was just a really bad fighter because he kept punching him in the chest and he wasn't punching him in the face. He was stabbing him, but he didn't realize that. And he was walking off and his friend said, you know, mate, it, it's a guy from England. He's like, mate, you're bleeding. And he looked down. And he's like, oh, we should probably go to hospital. And he showed me the picture where they have, uh, they have like a plastic, it looks like tape basically that they put over wounds to seal it up. And he had this like bubble of blood. And it was, I mean, it was in this region, the death zone right here. Um, he, he didn't know it. Other people have said they absolutely felt the sharp pain of it. Some people describe it as cold. Um, some of the people describe it as hot. 
Um, but the great thing about the great thing about all of this is whatever reaction you give your character, it's not going to be far off because it's such a different experience for everybody. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have some people that just don't have a clue. Um, when I, I think I have a picture on my, on my blog or somewhere where I had been kneed in the face and I had a really um, good hematoma here, they call it a mouse. And I had a nice fat hematoma and, um, it, I mean, it registered. I was like, oh, crud. And I just kind of kept fighting with my eye closed and everything. And after my coach is like, oh, what happened to you? And I'm like, what? And I looked in the mirror. I was like, whoa, that was a very different feeling than when um, I sprained my ankle. And people think, oh, a sprained sprain's not that big of a deal. Guys, sprains are so painful. Okay. It can hurt a lot. <laughs> it can hurt a lot. And it takes forever to heal because it's a white tissue injury and white tissue takes forever. And I, I left the fight uh, after the mat and I left the mat and I uh, started walking around as my adrenaline went down. I said, my ankle hurts. And my coach said, oh yeah, you, you pulled your ankle pretty hard. And I'm like, when did I pull my ankle? He's like, well, you, you sprained your own ankle. And I'm like, what do you mean I sprained it? I had crossed my feet. There's a position called guard. I had my legs around the person and I crossed my feet and was called a closed guard. And she was pushing against it. And I kept my feet closed and it just kind of dislocated mm -hmm. one of my feet. And in that moment, I didn't feel it. My coach could see it. He was like, oh, yeah, that's going to hurt, <laughs> you know. Um, so on the one hand, I got knee in the face and I absolutely understood, oh, crud, I I've been hurt. But also my head kicked back. So that's different. You know, my ankle, I had no idea. You have some people that absolutely have no clue they have been shot. They look down it, and you'll see people like, on the, you know, they used to have like ER, uh, EMT reality shows and people would look down and go, oh, and you would see them kind of even poking around. They're like, stop. Those people don't understand they've been shot. Then you have people who absolutely do understand. So I think whatever reaction you give your character isn't going to be too far off the mark. What is across the board is when that adrenaline ebbs, it's going to be much, much, much more painful. The people who didn't feel it absolutely will. The people who did feel it are going to feel it even more. After you have surgery, and I tell people this who have had surgery and, or a car accident or any kind of traumatic, and, and surgery is traumatic. Your mm -hmm. body, I didn't realize this until I had uh, back surgery and after the fact, um, a physical therapist put me on medication to help my uh, adrenal glands. And I'm like, why? He goes, your body doesn't know you had surgery. All it knows is somebody stabbed it. I'm like, oh, that's a, the reason you feel all those things even more the second and third day is because all that adrenaline is going away mm -hmm. and your body's registering, oh, we've been through something tough here. So no matter what level of pain you give your person at the moment of injury, it's probably going to be realistic. But what is across the board is the next day and the next day, it's going to hurt way worse, way worse. Yeah. Great answer. Okay. We had another question. Is there a style of fighting that I should look into for characters who need defensive fighting against unarmed opponents and have some sort of mobility or balance impairment? Think uh, MS, oh, sure. unreliable balance, fine. <gasps> oh, absolutely. That's perfect. Um, in that situation, you know, MS is one of those things, too, that it has so many different stages to it. You know, you may, and I have friends who uh, have MS that some days they seem just like, just like everybody else. And then some days they have more of a tremor. So I think that's really going to de depend on the situation. But for those people, um, guns, guns all day because you don't have to get close enough to somebody to be compromised. Um, if they can get a shotgun, that's even better because you don't really have to aim a shotgun. You mainly Fine just direct motor skills it. are not a part of <laughs> no. you don't know what a shotgun does. Okay. It's a cartridge on the inside and on the inside there's a lot of little pellets and it basically throws out all those pellets. And the farther the pellets go, the bigger the circle. Okay, so if that person is right in front of you, that shot circle is going to be this big and it might blow a hole right through them. If they're 20 feet from you, that shot circle might be this big around. But um, you're going to hit them, you know, with a shotgun. If you just are in the general direction, you're going to hit them with uh, some of the shot. Um, a handgun, definitely. 
um, if, if guns are not an option for you, then I would go with a blade. You really have got to put a weapon in the hand of those people because barring supernatural abilities, they're at a disadvantage. Um, <clears throat> there's a writer that I see quite often at writers' conferences. She is in um, a wheelchair and she has the most precious, everybody loves her dog. And I can't remember her dog's name, but I was talking to her a little bit about self-defense one time. And I, I sat and thought about it and I thought, okay, well, what, you know, what would she need to do? And the more I thought, the more, you know, I was like, she needs a weapon. She absolutely needs a weapon. Um, if they are in a chair, things like Aikido, A-I-K-I-D-O, um, are really good because it's good for fine joint manipulation. So if somebody reaches out, they have the ability with one hand to grab that hand and turn it over in such a way that it torques the wrist and injures it or it can even break it. So I would say gun, number one, knife, number two. I don't know if they would have the strength and dexterity to deal with a, uh, a sword. And yes, there are lighter swords. Katana, a katana is a very light sword for the first minute. And then it gets exponentially heavier and heavier and heavier. So they could have, uh, I don't, I don't know if a sword would work, but if you want them to have some type of hand to hand, I would choose something that deals with fine motor control, fine, uh, fighting fine smarter joint manipulation. rather than we don't want brute strength. We want to take your own body and use it against you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So Aikido would be a good one. Kung Fu. Kung Fu is really good about weapons of opportunity. Um, whatever is around them, they learn to make it into a weapon in some way is or another. Wing Chun, is that what I'm thinking of? Um, yes. De Wing Chun yeah. is a type of Kung Fu. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, if, if, if I recall without doing any research and totally just going with my brain is pulling out of nowhere, but that was um, at least traditionally developed by a woman for use against stronger men. And Ooh. so um, very, you know, Might relies be. heavily on let's fight smarter, not harder. Yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. And Kung Fu also, um, some of it was designed to be in crowded environments. So you have a very much an efficiency of movement. Um, and that's what you want as a fighter, no matter what style of fighting you do. And it's the same thing we fighting and writing have a lot in common. What fighters want is what writers want. You want max, maximum efficiency with minimal effort. That's what you want across the board. Yeah. So again, gun blade, uh, fine joint manipulation. And I did, and I would love to get back into it. Um, some taijutsu, um, which was, oh. Again, traditionally comes from you've got villagers fighting against armored samurai. So you've got right. people with no armor fighting people with armor. It's never about how hard can you hit. It's about no. what, what can you do with balance. And um, absolutely, that was one reason I liked that. that is, you know, it was right. not about brute strength. It was about being smart and using angles and using body weight. Absolutely. So, right. That's yeah. the whole concept of judo. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's not about who's bigger. It's about physics. That's what it's about. Yeah. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps. All right. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back and forth. Um, the spelling okay. is W-I-N-G-C-H-U-N. I just wanted to double check yes. that before I put Wing that Chun. on record. Yes. Um, so um, absolutely. Yeah. We had a question in the chat on on that. So and then Taijutsu, uh, T-A-I, literally body jutsu um, fighting. So G U. T S U J J U T S U. Sorry, I'm, mm -hmm. what's, what's really sad is I'm picturing Genius. it. I'm like trying to translate in Japanese for English. As I was like, exactly. you know Japanese, really yeah. Not, yeah, well, just, enough to, just enough, enough to get in trouble. transliteration. Just enough to get in trouble. People don't understand, but people are like, well, how do you spell it? And I'm like, you know, it's a transliteration. Right. So we just assign our letters to those sounds. <laughs> so right. is there a correct way? Eh. Well, and that's like the thing that always catches me up is, um, in Japanese, it's jujutsu, or it's jutsu, the U, and mm -hmm. then it's Bra in jutsu. Brazilian jujitsu with an I. And I, I always have to yes. stop and be like, okay, how do I write jiu this? <laughs> yeah. Right. And so. I've told people, like, I saw something like when I see the Japanese writing for jujitsu, and then underneath it, they have the Brazilian writing, Brazilian sounds. I'm like, oh, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And I have that in my book, too. That's another thing I write about in my book, is the different spellings and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, okay. These are great. So I'm going to keep an eye on the chat for more questions. Um, mm -hmm. I am going to ask you, like, if I 
am trying to pick my single best, and I think I know where you might go with this, but my single best all around practical use martial art to learn about. Oh, I hate this question. I know, I know. Okay, I know, keep sorry. going, keep going. Um, but for, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you different categories to answer in so you don't oh, have good. to limit yourself. Good. Like for my personal use walking around as a female and, or my, uh, my, my personal learning as a writer to write the best action, most plausible action scenes, or, you know, how do you, you know, you can choose whatever individual category of, of most useful that you would like to go. It's so, that's so difficult because, um, you and I, for example, are going to be attacked different ways. You are a taller person. Nobody's going to run up and pick you up. And right. throw you anywhere. Right. Okay. So that's especially not that after 2020 I, eating habits. That's not a not a thing that's going to happen. I'm telling you, <laughs> quarantine weight is a real thing. It's a real <laughs> thing. It, it just really, first of all, there's no wasted fighting style. Like there's no martial art that you think, well, I'm not going to learn that. It's useless. No such thing. And every martial art is best for what it is designed to do. Right. Now, I do teach self defense, and there are two that I prefer personally. Um, Muay Thai is one of them or boxing. Boxing is fine too. Um, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, also judo. The reason I like those three is because they all do live sparring. That is incredibly important. They all demand that you let people in your personal space without protective gear. Now in Muay Thai, you're going to have gloves, but I'm talking about like when um, there's some that when they spar, they have to have padding on the head, padding on the chest, padding on the legs. And it is like, it's like a security blanket. You need all that off. Um, so those, those are going to be my top three, but it's going to benefit people differently for me. I mean, of all the different arts that I've done, the one that had the greatest impact on me personally was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And that is because um, I grew up, I was raised in a household that was not safe. And so somebody being in my personal space absolutely just made me freeze, you know. And it, when I went to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it forced me to work through that terror. And, mm -hmm. and it was. I'm just going to say it like it was. it was. It was terror. And I used to have panic attacks and all that kind of stuff on the mat. It was a claustrophobia. And if I couldn't get cold air in my nose and all, you know, all these different things working together that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu forced me to work through. I have another friend who was raised in um, a, a similar environment and Muay Thai did the same thing to her. Um, so it really depends on the person. Um, for everyday self-defense, those are the three that I suggest the most, but you know what? They're, those three are not for everybody. First of all, if you are trying to figure out a fighting a martial art, you like you get up tomorrow and say, I want to do a martial art. Number one, what's closest to your house? Let's just be realistic. Um, if there is um, a judo gym that is five minutes down the road and there's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym that's 45 minutes down the road, look, what am I going to get to realistically more often? Okay. So number one, look at what's closest to your house. Two, what can you afford? Mm -hmm. Three, what can your body take? Mm -hmm. There are some martial arts that are um, a little more gentle on the body than others. And there are some that people just really gravitate toward. So first thing, again, what's close? What, what can you afford? And then go visit it and think, is, is it the thing that you just think, I can't stop thinking about this. I just want to keep going back and I want to keep going back. Then you keep going back. You know, if you're 60 years old, can you start Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Absolutely. If you're 60 years old, can you start Muay Thai? Mm, mm, yes, but you can't do as much sparring until your bones get sturdier. You know, can you be 70 and start Judo? Mm, mm, that's going to be a tough one. Um, can you be 70 and start Aikido? Absolutely. Um, or... Um, uh, tai Chi. Mm -hmm. We see Tai Chi. We see the slow version of Tai Chi is Tai Chi Chuan. I think that's the whole, I think that's the whole title. And what you see the people doing slowly when you fight, you do 
quickly. Right. Okay. You learn slow, you perform fast. I saw Keanu Reeves, which in his John Wick movies, he does all of that himself. He's done all that training himself. And my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym, we went as a group to watch one of the uh, movies and we we're like, that, that's how it is. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, but he was on the Jimmy Fallon show and he was talking about that. He said he was doing Tai Chi and Jimmy Fallon says, is that what you see the old people in the park doing? And he goes, yeah, it is. He goes, uh, you ever see anybody mess with those old people in the park doing Tai Chi? And Jimmy Fallon said, no, he goes, there's a reason for that. So you, you need to look at what's anything that gives you confidence, anything that makes you walk taller and confident and with a purpose makes you safer because, um, Violent offenders, they've done a study on violent offenders and uh, they had them watch CCTV footage in New York City. And they said, and, and in isolation, each one, they said, who would you attack? And again and again and again, they were picking out the same people. They did it in under seven seconds. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the little old ladies. It wasn't the tiny little women. Sometimes it was the big people. Sometimes, you know, and it had to do with the way they walked. And it was um, something in Stein. I forget the two psychologists, but they, I mean, again, they're like, why'd you choose, choose that? People are like, I, I don't know why I chose them. And so um, they had to go back and compare all the footage to see what these people had in common. They um, were distracted mm -hmm. or they did not seem to know where they were going or they walked in a certain way that showed they weren't confident. Maybe they were cowering. They weren't making eye contact. But something about them said, I am, I am vulnerable in some way. The little old lady with the chihuahua in her purse, nobody picked her because they knew that the chihuahua would make it stink. Mm -hmm. You know, so any martial art, any activity in your life that makes you walk in such a way that says, I'm, I'm not your gazelle. Okay, I'm a lion too. Right. That's what you need to do. And, and that may not be a martial art. It, it may be. You know, whatever activity you do, it may be tennis, you know, it, it, it may be CrossFit, it, whatever. Um, but whatever just makes you walk with an air that says, I am not your gazelle. Because of what does the lion do? The lion doesn't go out and think, you see that big gazelle over there with all the muscles? That's the one I'm going to get. No, they don't. What do they do? They pick out the weak ones. They pick out the small ones. And when an attacker, unless, of course, it's a situation where they know you, um, an attacker is going out and they're looking for the weakest gazelle. And so you need to walk out of the grocery store, not looking at your phone. You need to have a hand free. You don't need to be completely, you know, both of your hands occupied mm -hmm. and you need to walk upright. You need to make eye contact with people and let them know I see you. OK, it doesn't have to be. Uh, a long glance or interaction, you know, the, um, the greeters they have in like Walmart and Home Depot and all those, those people aren't greeters. There's a study that says if you've made eye contact with somebody, they're less likely to steal from you because they know that you can identify them. That's what those people are there for. They're there to make eye contact. It's loss prevention. Yeah. So again, whatever activity you have in your life that makes you walk like you're a lion and not the weakest gazelle, that's what you need to do. Great That's what I tell people in self-defense. Yeah. Great answer. Absolutely. Okay. So you and I, um, we, you know, we met at a speculative fiction conference. We're in yes. specific groups. So this yes. offers all kinds of possibilities. I know. Um, because, I love like, that. It's what I love about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, so like I'm working on a series right now where my humans are fighting winged humanoids. Okay. That changes Ooh. everything as far as, yes. you know, how, and I had to actually stop and take a lot of time to work out, okay, how would armor have developed? How would weapons have developed? Because these are, oh. you know, you, you've got ground air medieval battles, you know, right. <laughs> what is, right. what is this, how, you know, so to really work at that. So if um, somebody's sitting down to work on their fantasy or sci-fi or something and, mm -hmm they've got different species and they've got different environments. What's like a convenient starting checklist to oh how do we put together these things? Yeah. Sorry. By the way, everybody, those of you playing along at home, Carla didn't get these questions in advance. No, so I'm totally putting I her on the spot. Um, but just like, you know, things to, things to think about, you know, just when you're talking right. about, cause I know you have like a basic checklist of yeah things to, yeah. you know, how do I make my fight plausible? Right. Okay. Whenever you're um, up against some type of creature, no matter what it is. And in your case, I'm going to call it a creature, even though it's a basically a human, but they have wings. Mm -hmm. You have to think what gives them the advantage. 
Okay. And once you see what that advantage is, you think, okay, how can I negate that? How can I level the playing field? And, um, you know, you look out in nature, you're like, okay, if there is an eagle chasing me, what can I do? Well, I can run in my house. Eagle can't run in the house. Where are some other places I could hide from an eagle? An eagle cannot dive and get me in, in thick woods. An eagle cannot go after me in a narrow place because it negates their ability to use those wings to the fullest. So I think I used um, Thanos as an example. Um, in, in something I wrote, I used Thanos as an example because nothing beat Thanos except a tiny, tiny, wasn't it tiny little micro kind of robot that they finally got to infiltrate him? Oh, hold on. Oh, did I lose you? Yeah, no, you know we're, what? My we're battery's good. getting we're good. low. Let me plug in my phone. Let me plug in my phone. Hold on. I'm so Nothing sorry. beats Thanos okay. except phone batteries. Okay, Thanos lost his charger and, and boom, everything's gone. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? I can still hear you. You're a little bit quieter, but we're here. Oh no. It's okay. Let me see if I can pump your volume. Ooh, no, I don't think I can pump your volume. Let me see what I can do. I'm sorry. This is draining the battery on my phone. And when I, when I plug it in, you can't hear me, can you? Oh, no, I got you now. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can do this. All right. I'm on low battery mode, just so you know. Oh. Okay. So figure out what makes them powerful and figure out the way to negate that. For example, a robot. Okay. Well, what kind of robot is it? Let's say it's a robot that looks like a human. Well, it's, if it looks like a human, it's going to have to be somewhere in the human weight range or it's not going to be able to use furniture and all that kind of stuff that a human uses. Okay, what can you do to take down a human that you could take down a robot? If you damage a robot's ability to see, then you've defeated it in one way. And also, don't, don't get in the mindset that you have to beat it. You don't have to beat it. You just have to best it. Right. Yeah. And don't, so don't think, and, and that's something when I work with writers, they're like, well, I want them to totally, I'm like, look, let's just be realistic. They are, if you're up against a bear, your job is not to totally obliterate that bear. Your job is to make that bear pause long enough for you to get away. So think about besting something rather than beating it. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you know, in most cases, you know, fights for survival are not competition fights. Nobody is awarding points, right? Like no. if, if you're still breathing at the end, you win. So, right. um, you know, I don't, I don't need to have, com if I can avoid the fight in the first place, I win, yes. you know? So yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, because you are on low battery, we do have another question I'm in the sorry. chat, but I'm going to, um, push just a little bit. Um, maybe Natalie, if you want to email that to Carla, because she is awesome sure. and, um, she will take care my of blog. that you privately. And I'm sorry, but I just, I want to push through. Um, cause I don't want to like lose Carla mid sentence. That would be really I'm so sorry. tragic. No, we're, we're good. Like we, we've already gone an hour and 15 minutes. I mean, we're having an awesome time. Like we just, I oh know, right. <laughs> we can, I, I said we would just keep going till 8am. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was like, my gosh, 30 minutes. My battery's already. Okay. Now it makes more sense. Yeah. No, okay, we're, <laughs> no we're putting time. Okay. In. Okay. Yeah. Natalie, Natalie says no worries. So I'm, I'm going to have her send to you privately. Um, okay, but good. Carla, let's, let's wrap up. Tell us again, all the places we can find you and give us a plug on why every writer needs fight, write the book. Okay, good. Uh, first, uh, fight right, F I G H T W R I T E dot net. That is the hub where you can find the book, find the blog. Up in the uh, top corner, it says more fight right, and you'll have YouTube, you'll have the podcast, you can get t shirts off of Etsy. The thing about my book is what seems to surprise people it's not just about punching and kicking, it is not just about fighting. If you have any type of confrontation, any type of action in your work, it's going to work for you. Even if you just have somebody in your work that's kind of manipulative, manipulative, it talks about that. So it's, it's about, um, okay, the very first section is, hold on, you would think I'd know my book. <laughs> okay. It is divided in a five section, just like um, 
a five round championship MMA fight. And the very first section has to do with actually writing action and violent scene and the things that you need to consider before you actually even start writing the fight scene. For example, the number one most important consideration in a fight scene is why it's happening. It's not who, it's why. Why is more important than who? And I explain that. Where is more important than who? And I explain that too. For example, um, in a fight between me and a shark, who's going to win? Well, are we on the beach or are we in the water? So where you're fighting is a big deal. Uh, the second round is about being human. And it's all the aspects, everything that goes into the fight just because we're human. It talks about being afraid, adrenaline, fight, flight. And there's more reactions than just fight or flight. Okay. okay? So I got to jump in as like the, the resident yes. behavior nerd here. We talk about there being f the four Fs in, in behavior. Um, and that's fight, flight, fool around, and reproduction. And yeah. um, <laughs> those you will, under stress, you're going to have one of those four. Yeah. Right. Fight, flight, posture, submit, fool around. <laughs> that that is a legitimate self-defense thing i talk about female aggression pre-incident indicators those are the things that your villain is gonna do before they ever attack and that's something that can help you out in the real world too this is based on real world experience yes. things that tell you an attack is imminent round three that does talk about all the different fighting styles round four is about different types of weaponry round five is injuries and that is so important. Um, I go through sanctioned fight in injuries. So, you know, um, black eye, busted lip, you know, dislocated this and that. But I also go through street fight injuries. For example, a fish hook where you rip somebody's uh, cheek, rip somebody's nose, um, pull a wad of somebody's hair out. That's actually dangerous. If it's right here, it could cause a hematoma, which could cause blindness. So little things like that. Um, stages of death stages of stages of death which people like you mean decomposition no actually stages of death because people think the heart stops beating you're dead no there's a cascade of events and i actually have a friend who died on the operating table and came back to life and i have her account in here so stages of death stages of decomposition stages of bleeding out and it's all these things so that instead of saying he was dead for two hours instead you can say he was pale but warm Okay, well, that's that's something that happens after two hours. Mm -hmm. um, you'll also find out how much wood you really need to burn a body. It's not what you think. It's a whole lot of wood. You <laughs> gotta have a whole lot of wood. And the body does really weird things in the process of being cremated. So it's not just about punching and kicking. It's tons of uh, um, information about fight scenes, action, violence, and confrontation as a whole. My series with Writer's Digest they call it um, crafting confrontation because it's more than just fighting. Yeah. So that's the plug for my book. It's a whole lot of things. And that tends to be what surprises people my about the book. All time favorite TV show that you have never heard of is called Remember When, W E N N. It's about a radio station in the late 1930s and it's fantastic. But there's this scene, I mean, the writing in the whole show is awesome. But there's one thing that mm -hmm. keeps coming back every time we talk about this kind of stuff. Um, and the, the radio uh, manager, the radio station manager is talking with one of the sponsors and he's like, well, I know the sponsor's like, there's not enough violence in my show that I'm sponsoring. I want more violence. I want more violence. He's like, well, I know you don't want violence for violence sake. You want more external physicalization of the emotional conflict. And he's like, no, I yeah. want more violence. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's a hilarious episode anyway, but you know, just the whole thing on um, how all of those things that you just mentioned are so tied up in plot and character and there's really they no really way to are. break them apart and um and so yeah it's just uh yeah so, so natalie in the in the chat says this sounds so useful yes so there you go it, it, go get the book i go mean on. i don't mean to i mean i don't mean to well no i do mean to plug my own book it, it is because i did a butt ton yes that's a word butt ton it's of research technical measurement for this yeah. book Yes, it's a technical measurement. Yeah. It, it's not just me sitting down and saying, oh, this is what happened to me when I was in Taekwondo. This is what happened to me in Judo. No, this is hundreds of hours of research I did in the book. So, And I also had professionals go through it. I had a professional striking person, professional weapons person, professional groundwork person, professional um, uh, anything that's in a doctor. 
any, a lawyer, I have an entire section that a lawyer wrote on the legal ramifications of self-defense. So I had professionals go through this and double check me on everything. So it's not just me spitting out information. Somebody went through with a fine tooth comb and said, this is correct. This is not, this is correct. And I had to make sure everything was straight on board with professionals as well. Okay. So a lot of work went into it. Awesome. So one final question before we break. Halloween yes. is coming. It's the end of October. <gasps> We're going to get a second full moon. When the zombies oh. descend, I have a yes. shovel and a bat, and I only have time to grab one. Which one do I go for? Bat. Because it's so much easier to run with bat. Again, you know, I, don't have to, I don't have to beat them. I just have to survive. Great. That's yeah. right. And a shovel, you know, they're not as easy to wield as a bat. A bat is made for batting. A shovel, uh, it's a little bit harder to run around with. Actually, this is terrible. If zombies are chasing you, better than a bat, better than a shovel, or just a lot of people who are slower than you. That's really the most important thing. <laughs> that was true. So what I'm hearing is I need to take up training and actually learn to jog just to survive. Yeah, is that, okay. or make friends right. with people who are slow. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm going to let you go there. Uh, we, we, have, we have some debate in the chat, but the shovel has a char sharp edge. I know but you'll, uh, you can't Carla, run with it. Carly can take that at the, um, the or, or, or hide at the old folks home. Man, we got some heartless but pragmatic <gasps> th things oh. coming in here. So. <laughs> Yeah, what oh. you don't know is the old folks home is the zombie, you know, that's the, that's ground zero for the zombies. That's why they're, that's why they're shuffling. That's right. Straight okay. up. Um, all right. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to let you go and, and go rescue your phone. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this was Thank great. you for having me. This yeah. was great. And, um, and then everybody, uh, everybody in the chat, same thing. This will be up on YouTube, uh, with subtitles in a couple of days, or I guess closed captioning technically in a couple of days oh. and it'll be out on the podcast. Um, those of you who have recently followed and thank you. Those of you who have recently subscribed, huge. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, so fightright.net, go find Carla and everything that she offers because there's a phenomenal on YouTube, amount of information out there. So. The channel on YouTube is Fight Right, F I G H T W R I T E, one, one word. Okay, awesome. All right, and that is it. So we're going to wrap there. Thank you guys very much. And um, I guess I will see, see you guys next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye.